Welcome to the Wiggly Podcast. I'm Heather from Wiggly Wigglers. And I'm Farmer Phil from The Farm. Lovely. Normally we would bring you our show about gardening, farming and making your good life easy, perhaps from our kitchen table or the Wiggly sofa. But today, dear listener, we're bringing you our show from... A sand dune. A sand dune in Oregon. We're at Gold Beach in Oregon and we're just walking down to the seashore. So any background sounds of wind and sea are um, by design. Well, they're by design. This week's show, we've got Terry coming up and we've got a special treat for all you Ricardo fans. What is wrong with you? (laughs) Please. (laughs) Ricardo is bringing us an allotment feature from Kington. Kington is on the Herefordshire Welsh borders, up in the air a bit, isn't it? Yeah, a bit wild and woolly up there. And he's been there working with allotment gardeners. So let's kick off with Ricardo in Kington. Welcome back, old bean. Welcome back. Hello, listener. I've just come down to an allotment just outside Kington on the bypass. Set up a couple of years ago now. And uh, one of the persons instrumental in the whole process of setting it up, which is no mean feat, I have to say, is Celia Kibblewhite. And that's who I'm going to speak to now, as a production association with Community First and Reach. Hello, Celia. Hello, Richard. You're bent over in your wonderful plot. I mean, it's, uh, the last time I came down here was in the winter, and it looked staggeringly different. Yes, that's to, right. To how it now. Yes, it was all bare then. There wasn't much sign of vegetables, but it's, um, it, very different now. It is. A, it's a wonderful layout. This space. You've secured a spot in the bend of the River Arrow. Yes, that's quite just right. Just outside Kington. Very fertile ground, I should think. Essentially, on a, on a floodplain. Yes, it is very well, fertile. Yes, but does need the texture of the soil can be improved in terms of the sort of organic matter the humus and so forth so we're definitely inc- increasing that each year by adding manure and leaf mold to the soil yeah yeah i mean that's 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 the key isn't it really yeah. obviously it looks uh, vastly different to how it looks when you when you've secured the site how many years ago now that was three years ago now this is okay. our third growing season so it's remarkable how much has been achieved in that in that relatively short space of time very much so in fact the first year we opened up right at the beginning of June, which was quite late in the year. And thanks to the huge enthusiasm of all the plot holders in waiting, a garden was growing very quickly on every plot, and it was really encouraging to see how fast that happened. Is there a waiting list now? Yes, there is actually, uh, more than we had in the original instance. So we started out with 23 people wanting plots, and we now have a waiting list of 25. So Right, yeah. right. Tell me a little bit about the process, though, because I, I think there are lots of villages right there across the country now that would like to secure a spot to put in some allotments because yes. you know, there is a real interest, a genuine interest amongst many people now, and they're really quite keen to, to you know to get involved. I think there's a, there's a reasonable amount of work involved, isn't there? Yes, there is. I mean, there are a number of different ways you can go about setting up allotments. One way is through your local parish council, and in order to start that process someone needs to get together a list of at least six names of people wanting to have an allotment and then it sort of comes into play that that's a duty then of the town or parish council to provide those allotments. However, that being said, there are lots of issues to do with what land may or may not be available and whether or not a parish council is the quickest or easiest way of getting hold of an allotment site. So actually in this case, this is a privately rented plot where we have an allotments association who are a constituted group, and we rent our land directly from a landlady at the moment on a sort of renewable basis. And that differs from statutory allotments because a statutory allotment is always on land owned by a local authority and is generally a permanent site. So, yes, ours is sort of voluntary managed and was set up privately. Is this lease more vulnerable than than a, than a statutory one, would you say? Yes, it is. I mean, one of the disadvantages of a temporary site is that you can't necessarily raise capital for improvements such as sort of laying on water or fencing or composting toilets. You know, those sort of amounts of money are un- unlikely to be granted to a site that maybe only has two or three years' security on it. Mm. However, we are hoping that we'll eventually purchase this bit of land. Obviously, these things can't be rushed necessarily, so we're sort of in negotiation, let us say. Sure. A little bit of support from groups like the local parish council, possibly 
one of the lottery funds. Yeah. <coughs> we're also accumulating a bit of money from our rent. So we're plot holders rent a plot and the association rents the, the site as a whole. We put a bit of money aside each year towards a fund that we will hope to put into okay. purchase. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And uh, I, I can yeah. imagine she's quite impressed. Yes, she's a, a farming lady and this bit of land was bought by her late husband when the bypass was built around Kington. And it had never really had anything done to it or happen on it. And she really loved it right from the start. So she's very supportive and she's coming along tomorrow to our open day. Um, should, we, should we go have a wander down onto your lovely site? And uh, what's, what's particularly pleasant about this space? I mean, I, well, I suppose we could sort of describe it a little bit for the benefit of the listener. There's a lot of colour now. I mean, that's one of the beauties, I suppose, of, of allotments. The, the character of each of the people that are responsible for each plot sort of comes out in their own space, doesn't it? Yes. And there are lupins and there are foxgloves yeah. and there are various bedding plants and croissants and things like that in amongst a melee of vegetables of various shapes and sizes. Yep, that's right. And uh, I I love looking around and seeing the different ways people do things. And I've actually come to the conclusion that there are are as many different ways of gardening as there are gardeners out there. Every single one is different. Yeah, for sure. Sort of production levels of of each plot differs, doesn't it? Yes, it does, yes. And that sort of reflects different people's uses of their plots. Mm. You know, some people are more active in terms of the the volume of food they're producing and other people probably come down here to sort of spend a pleasant time and they produce some food and, you know, there's not too much pressure, hopefully, down here. Definitely. Come on, let's have a a look down here. There's a fabulous bumblebee just kind of hovering around your geraniums there as we we walk onto the site. Now, all these these sites are slightly triangular, aren't they, because of the lay of the land, if you like. But when you set this up, I mean, there are are obviously various kind of hurdles that you had to sort of overcome. I mean, from your recollection, were there any people that were dead against the idea? No, that was interesting, actually, because whereas we have had some issues in our local council and in the community over time, it just felt that this was one thing that almost everybody felt positive about for their own reasons. It really didn't, didn't seem to engender any problems of that kind. They were practical problems that we had to overcome, but not group ones or social ones really that's quite encouraging that's mm. wonderful so just kind of walking underneath this uh, it's uh, almost an, an arbor it's, it's a bower it yes. is a bower which is uh, a yes. contributor in the background and, and you've used hazel and i think yes. that's one of the, the, the another uh, fascinating element of allotmenteering if you like is the ability to support. yes and that's one of the great appeals is that so much of this sort of thing basically takes place outside money in every way we're connecting directly with sort of natural wealth let's say yeah um, no that's that's yeah. uh, absolutely <laughs> right that's, that's very true back martin yeah. my father has helped by building a, a twilly along each side which which holds the whole thing together it's basically a sort of twisting rail of pieces of hazel that just keeps the whole thing in in shape yeah, now this is a this is a difficult question to answer but what's your favorite veg Ooh, right I, I think it varies at different times of the year in that in the spring we eat an awful lot of wild herbs really um mint well not wild exactly but self-sown things like mint fennel rockets land crest that sort of thing and they just seem to come up first so we enjoy those flavors yeah there's something yeah. in that isn't there you know that the first yeah. flavors of the growing yeah, season really yeah I mean, I particularly like these yeah. chaps, you know, where yeah. these, these broad beans, because I, I, I just think they're the, probably the first substantial vegetable yes. of the growing season. Yes. And, and even to the extent, I mean, we haven't had many black fly this year. And, and as I kind of, I'm just, I might take the liberty just to pick out the top of this one, oh, yeah. uh, just to, just to uh, do that. And, but I really quite like the... I like the ah. tips of ah. the broad beans. I mean, ah. I think they're sometimes quite nice when they're steamed a little bit. Yeah. But the tips are delicious because mm. they have you tried have you no, not I tried? Actually, no. mm. they are be, they are broad beanie oh yeah so they're cracking mm. in a salad and, and oh very good mm. so you sort of but the key is obviously to, mm. to get them out before the black fly descends yeah, because that doesn't that doesn't add anything no, to the uh, to the, the flavor yeah. so compared to the courgettes they really feel like you've eaten something you know satisfying you do you do and I, mm. I, and, and, and equally you know when your broad beans are essentially all matured they freeze very well don't they because mm, then you, right. you you will have your bellottis now or your yeah. your runners and your your french beans and things yeah. like this but the, your broad beans then could be stashed away for the winter mm. so you've got a, you know a lovely supply of those beauties right through the when yeah. things are a little bit tight when when of course you know french beans yeah. bellotti beans don't don't freeze that well no do they? however i am planning and intending to dry my bellotti beans if we get a long enough season this 
yeah. Right. Right. And then save them as dried beans for stews and so yeah, forth. Yeah, that's a good Because I thought it'd be nice to try that instead of things like soya and chickpeas that we're not growing here. Mm. That's a cracking idea. Now, compost, now that's something, again, that's particularly close to my heart. And when you mm. kind of stare around the, the site here, there are some, you know, yeah. compost bins of various quality, yes. I suppose you could say. Yes. And now, you know, there's a, there's a plot over there that has yeah. you know, relatively new locally harvested chestnut that's right. as its compost bin. Yeah. Those and are the most beautiful very, compost bins. They bins, are very fine, aren't yes, they? they? Yeah, are lovely yeah. to look at. Actually, that, that's a product. I mean, you could, you could yeah. market that, yes. for, for sure. Yes. Um, whereas some of the other compost bins on the site, you couldn't really market them, no, but they I, are functional. I agree very much so. And I think we would like a better one in due course ourselves, but, you know, the one we've got contains its two heaps and, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it's sort of held together just about. And how, do you, okay. how do you get on? How do you fare with composting? Are you, uh, are you quite happy with the amount yeah. that you, you sort of produce or you can use? Well, I really feel I'm still learning about composting. I've been trying out various things and I feel it must be a great art and it's all about blending different things and understanding the processes that are going on. Anyway, uh, it's lovely to be it able is, to it just... Is, it's a wonderful loop, though, isn't yeah. it? There's no, there's no waste on an allotment at no. all. Everything is, is recycled, everything yes. is, is reused. And, yes. and, and, what, and what's particularly ingenious in, in this instance, again, is that you've got sunflowers, for instance, growing yeah. around the base of your compost heap. And, of course, yeah. they're going to benefit from all that nutrient that's leaching yes. from it. And, and down at the other end, next to my neighbours at the narrow end of my plot I've got my neighbour's compost heap and everything that I plant there grows enormous bumblebees just kind of yeah. bustling their way into these long <laughs> trumpety trumpety flowers yes, we used to like trapping them inside yeah that's right listening to them getting angry <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. I've forgotten all about that yeah now this, there's a gentleman just pulled up in a van and what's, what's he doing Is he, he seems to be setting up something here there's a, oh, uh, a nice little sort of marquee going up and some yeah. tables and trestles and things like that yeah well this is all to do with our open day tomorrow and we're just setting up an activity for tomorrow which is a mosaic making activity for children wonderful yeah from all the um, bits of pottery we've been finding in the river. So okay. we're going to do something with them. Oh, that's wonderful. What a cracking idea. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's yeah. lovely. And I believe we're off to uh, another open day that you've helped to sort of bring together. Yes, know. that's right. Pembridge New Allotment Site is having its official opening this, uh, this afternoon. So right. we're going to go along and find out how they've got on. We've landed, we've driven out to, uh, to Pembridge for the op- opening, grand the grand day. opening, yeah, of their community allotments. And it looks a bit like a sort of barren wasteland with, with a couple of sheds on it at the moment, doesn't it? it, it it's and, the and beginnings, the very early days of, a, of an allotment. What a, what yeah. a contrast from the, your, your <laughs> fabulous space down at Kington. Well, it's, it's very reminiscent of how it was when we started, which was only two years ago that we broke the ground there from what was a, a meadow. There's a kind of assembly of folks in, in assorted vehicles and tentage and children and things like that Bicycle. all sort of milling around, bringing some, some treats and, uh, and liquid refreshment. Should yeah. we go and, go and have a look? Good idea. I think somebody's just arrived with some champagne, so... Oh, yeah. fantastic. <laughs> We've, we've, we've wandered down and we've, we're, we're just talking to two ladies here who are, who are dressed in their summer attire, one of whom has cycled out from Pembridge, I believe. I'm Kate, Kate Skelton. Okay. I'm actually the chairman of the Allotments Association right. at the moment. OK, <laughs> at, the, at the moment. You say, you say that as if you might be sort of looking forward to handing that particular role over in a over few months, in the, in I think, future. probably, yes. Yeah. yeah, there's been a lot of work involved in this, but yeah. uh, no, it's great to see it going. So there's a tactical ploy, really, of being able to be involved in this process before the really nice job sort of working. Absolutely, uh, uh, I can sit working back on the land is there. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. And madam, what's your, what's your name? My name is uh, Liz Scott okay. and I've been involved with setting up this allotment project. Right. It's been difficult but we've got there in the end anyway. Yeah. Yes. When did this kind of occur to you to, uh, to uh, put the wheels in motion really? To... Oh, 18 a years ago. Yes, at least. Yes, at least. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's not bad really, is it? It's not bad. Okay. Um, who didn't mm-hmm. have any luck in finding land. So it's actually all got going since a friend farmer friendly farmer that we already knew for some time mm. said we have some land would you like to use it used right. to be allotments years ago so it's an independent association now it's privately run wonderful okay and uh, and you had a full backing from the whole community pretty much uh, plenty of interest in taking on plots interest, yeah we've got 13 plots filled now which is all we had allowed for to start with so okay. we're hoping that more people will come along and extend the plots later uh, is this what you had in mind when when the idea occurred to you originally could you have, have envisioned something as wonderful as this we were open to anything that came along really we just really wanted a chance to grow 
our food and there were a good group of us who, who were well motivated in trying to get it done so we're just very pleased to have anything that we were offered and this is a fantastic site it's sunny it's, it's open and we've got a really nice group of people working on it. Right. And uh, it's a, a nice little gathering of people now, uh, some of whom I don't suppose we know each other that well. No, well, that was part of the uh, idea of having this, this gathering, this sort of informal opening ceremony now. Several people have met each other over the weeks as they've bumped into each other on the allotments, but as for learning people's names or all meeting each other all at once, it's not happened yet, so we're going to have a nice drink and a piece of cake. That's fabulous. Well, thanks very much for talking to us. Mm, thank you very much for coming along. We got the opportunity to talk to the landowners nonetheless, which is a rare thing, you know. Uh, landowners of allotments always seem to be strangely absent. But you've come along, you've made your presence felt today. Are you pleased we've been able to have the chance to be able to do something like this, support the community in this way? Yeah, fits our philosophy really, because we're not quite traditional. So uh, So what, how, what do you farm primarily? Cider fruit. Oh dear. And uh, what is that, Westerns or Bulmers or...? Uh, gamers. Gamers? Yeah, <laughs> or Magnus, the end. Magnus now. <laughs> Magnus, yeah, that's right, Magnus, yeah. Yeah, good old Irish uh, apple uh, grown in Hereford. That's right, yeah. <laughs> keep quiet about that. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Yeah, fair play. What are your names, fellas? Kit. My name's Oliver. And uh, are you guys come to do some gardening today? Not no, sure. Probably just for the cakes and the brownies and, st- yeah. brownies and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> that seems like a good idea, yeah. Do you, uh, do, you, uh, do, you have any, do you do any gardening or anything at school or at home? A bit of it. Yeah? Yeah. 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 Not much. Yeah. So. Sometimes at my friend's house. Oh, wow, uh, OK. What do they get you doing at your friend's house? Just garden. Just, you know, just gardening, yeah? What, sort of mowing the lawns and things like that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I bet they do. I, how old are you? Four. Four. And how old are you? No, I'm going to be no. ten on Monday. Oh, wow, OK, that's a fantastic... Well, that's getting, that's getting quite grown days. up, isn't it, really? In two days. In two days, yeah. That's so what have you bought him for his birthday? Don't tell me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I shouldn't have asked, should I? No. I shouldn't have asked. I, I wish you well, and uh, yeah. I, I'm sure that in uh, you know in a couple of years' time you'll have extremely green Can fingers. Can you play it after this? Can I, can I do what? Play it. Can I play it? I can't... I, I could play it, but I haven't got a... A, uh, a pair of earphones so you can't hear it but what we'll do is make sure that you know where it's going to be uh, put up on the internet so that you can oh, listen to internet, it right? we'll go on the internet yeah so you guys will be able to listen to your voices then all right okay, yeah. okay i'll see you later Bye. <laughs> ladies and gents can i just very briefly have your attention we thought we'd have a party to celebrate the inauguration of the allotments the first 13 have been established and in years to come, you will look at this and it will be a paradise of garden sheds, of produce, of cut flowers and so on. But for the moment, it is a field that's been dug through everybody's efforts. And in order to celebrate, I ask you please to raise your glasses to the Pembridge Allotments Association and all who dig on them. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Now, if I'm the reason that we're in Oregon is... We are on tour with the BASP, which is the British Association of Seed Producers. And I believe you are, in fact, the president. Uh, Well, chairman, please. (laughs) And we're here looking at grass seed production in Oregon, which is one of the world centres of grass seed production. Why is it so special for grass seed? Well, I think it's a combination of climate and soil just conspires to make it an excellent crop to grow. We're west of the Cascade mountain range. They have very high rainfall in the winter and very predictably sunny summers. And so that means that it's difficult to get on the ground with crops that don't like too much water in the wintertime. Now, grass is a crop that happens to flourish with lots of water in the wintertime and obviously the predictably dry summer makes it much easier to harvest. So they get really good yields and really good quality. And they've got fantastic support from their universities. Their extent, well, what they call an extension service is to die for. I suppose we used to have it in the form of, of ADAS and gradually... What's our, ADAS? I can't remember what it stands for, but Agricultural Development Something and Something Service. Advisory Service. That'll be it. That government funded research and government funded advice for farmers has dwindled over the years, but not here and they use their extension service and their links with the university, in this case Oregon State, all the time. They have a really good relationship. And obviously water's always an issue, isn't it? Well, here They in seem Oregon, to have got tons of water here. <clears throat> well, it, it varies, doesn't it? I mean, within a few miles, you go east of the Cascade Mountain Range and it's what they call high desert. 
and you can't grow anything without irrigating. So um, that's when they use those circly things? That's right, they've got all these pivot irrigators so the whole thing looks like a dose of circles from the air and they grow crops in 150 acre patches that are circular. But obviously the water use is huge. And what about the relevance to our gardens from, you know, many of us have got a lawn. I mean, Wiggly's aim has been to reduce the size of people's lawns to do something more useful. But you do need a lawn lots of times to play football on and well, that's right. snow and for men to um, get out more. And The group of grasses, a large percentage of the grass is grown here in Oregon and a smaller percentage at home are what are called amenity grasses, i.e. for sports turf, for golf courses, for lawns, for those general amenity areas. And they're not the same grasses, by and large, as you use to grow silage, otherwise you'd be mowing the lawn or the golf course about three times as often as you do now. So they're selected for their qualities. Are to these a, Kentucky bluegrass? <clears throat> almost always a mixture. So here they grow a lot of Kentucky bluegrass, which is smooth stalk meadow grass. They grow a lot of tall fescue. They grow a load of fine fescues for golf greens and things like that. And they grow amenity rye grasses, which give wear and colour and sort of depth, if you like. They, they fill in the gaps. And we grow amenity rye grasses at home but we don't grow so much of the fescues and we don't grow any Kentucky bluegrass, to my knowledge. And so they found out that actually different varieties make a huge difference to how much you and I and America needs to water their lawn. Well, we went to a, a research institute called NextGen, who are a private company who take commissions from the government and various other bodies, and they'd done an extensive body of research into the drought tolerance of different species and different varieties. And they were shocked to find that, for example, within Kentucky bluegrass, the difference in water required to water a 5,000 square foot plot, which is the average size of the American lawn, for the summer was about 9,000 gallons of water. 9,000 gallons? If you did the same experiment with ryegrass, the difference was about 3,000 gallons. And with tall fescue, about five or 6,000 gallons. So that you can see that the selection of variety for drought tolerance could make a massive difference to the quantity of clean water. Remember, these lawns are being watered with drinking quality water so that the quantity of drinking quality water we need to produce could be radically reduced. There are an awful lot of American gardens, just as there are an awful lot of gardens at home. This requirement for irrigation can be drastically reduced. And another interesting thing that they came up with was they took one variety of a species, say an amenity ryegrass, planted out a load of the plants and conducted tests to select within that group of plants the most drought-tolerant ones, by selecting those with the biggest roots. Within two rounds of selection, if you like, so that they selected them and then grew them on again for the second time and then selected them, they had achieved an 80% improvement in drought tolerance, and that was within the variety. So just a minute, because is this that the grass looks green, so you don't need to water it, or is it that the root of the grass goes further down? Because what does it actually mean to be drought tolerant? Good question, because in Britain we have some varieties which are so-called stay green, so that their leaves are green even when they're dead. Handy. And dormant. So that that sort of gets around that idea. But these grasses we're talking about are not like that. They are genuinely still alive and green, but because of their growth habit, i.e. they grow not too much top and they've got a lot of root, they are more drought persistent. So they will stay greener without watering for longer. And then consequently, they by and large seem to require less water to maintain them at that point. Now I've got my Wiggly Wiggly sweatshirt on today, Phil, so I'd like you to read the back of it from the bottom up because I've got a great tip for your lawn mowers and your lawn. From the bottom up, please, I'll just turn around. Here we go. You take the thing. And it says, I save my kitchen waste for the worms. I do. I've fed my garden birds all year round. I do. A good wife. I've saved a lawnmower by planting a wildflower meadow. <laughs> 
So um, here we are. The irony of being on a grass trip is that you grow grass for people to mow and I grow wildflower lawns for people not to mow, which are drought resistant and also encourage people to rip up that lawn and do something more useful with it. But it is fair <laughs> to say that today is the first day on the trip you've dared wear that. Bonnet. That is true. <laughs> that is so, so true. They've all gone now. Nearly got to the ocean. You can't call this a sea, Phil. It's impossible. It's Be a bit big for that, isn't it? Yeah. And we're in these sand dunes, which have got loads of sort of grass and ruttock growing on them. And we've just come out onto a <laughs> near deserted, apparently endless beach, <laughs> strewn with bits of timber and assorted floating ullage. It looks like a tree's graveyard to the right, doesn't it? That's a foghorn I can hear in the distance. Yeah because the sea fog comes in off the sea. There we are. So, from the wild west of Oregon, we're just getting to the edge of the ocean so that we can put a message out for Donald, who we'd like to thank him and Donna for putting us up on their farm. Or even putting up with us on their farm. Yeah, in Corvallis last week. And in fact, we'll have Donna on next week's show talking about peonies because she's got a fantastic flower farm and floristry business. But until then, for those of you that listen to the Dukes of Hazard or um, are from Oregon, I'd like to say, breaker, breaker, I got a smoky on my donkey. And for those of you from England, that means... The philosopher of the lure is chasing I down the road in my car. <laughs> and this did actually happen to us in Albany uh, for a few moments last week. Lucky, 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 he wasn't after us. Well, we outran him. Yeah. <laughs> so it's bye from us from a wild, windy Oregon beach. Bye from me. <laughs>